Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of AMI, exploring the mental health challenges faced by AAPI artists. I'm your host, Ann Fan, and we are so thrilled to have you here today. This episode is made possible by partnership with Asian Media Network. And stay tuned to hear more about our sponsorship with Synergy Health Recovery. Thank you. AMI stands for AAPI Artists for Mental Illness, a 501c3 nonprofit organization based in Los Angeles, California. As a CEO and founder of AMI, I am proud to say that my organization aims to promote mental wellness within the AAPI community through the arts. Through our work, we aim to challenge the stigma and silence around mental health issues in the AAPI community and to provide resources and support for those who are struggling. We believe that by empowering artists to share their stories and perspectives on mental health, we can create a more inclusive and compassionate society that value mental wellness for all. Before we dive deeper into our discussion, we would like to extend a special thank you to our sponsor, Synergy Empowering Recovery. Their beautiful studio located here in Beverly Hills, California, provides the perfect setting for our conversation today. They specialize in empowering recovery for those struggling with substance abuse and other behaviors that hinder personal growth. Their unique approach includes 12 months of ongoing monitoring, offering the best chance for long-term recovery. Hi, Sophie. Thank you for coming here today. Hi, thank you so much for having me. First of all, I am tremendously in awe by you because your family helped shape up my childhood as well as my sister and a lot of Vietnamese uh, community. So I just want to say um, having you here and you trusting us with your experience means the world to me. And so today we're going to talk about nurturing minds and culture and an in-depth conversation with Sophie from Mommy and Me Vietnamese Production. I want you to share a little bit about yourself and your background and how to get into this wonderful world of entertainment. Oh boy, okay. Well, <laughs> buckle up because it's gonna be a long answer then. Um, so first of all, I'm Sophie. Um, I was born here in the US uh, to two parents who um, were um, computer programmers. Um, so just let's, I think my story really begins uh, when my parents' um, refugee story uh, begins because it, it sets the whole premise for my life. But um, my parents escaped from Vietnam separately um, in 1979, 1980. And when they came to the U.S., they met at a refugee camp, but when they uh, came to the U.S., um, they were faced with uh, choosing a career that was safe and sturdy. My mom back in Vietnam, she was in a theater group um, that is kind of similar to like uh, SNL, Saturday Night Live, where they would do skits and stuff. And she really enjoyed that. But when she came to the U.S., she had to do something safe. So she ended up going to Temple University uh, for computer science. So uh Fast forward, they were having these two like great successful jobs and then they had me. And when they had me um, and they went to work, my grandma was at home with me and they wanted to look for content, video programs that taught me Vietnamese while they were away and they couldn't find any. And so they actually decided to make their own. And so when they created these videos, um, our family and friends, they just loved it so much. They were like, hey, can we have a copy? And, you know, it, word spread and everyone wanted a copy. And, you know, fast forward, it became a business and they had created the HF Productions. And in the 90s, it became globally known. It was very popular for being the only um, children's programming uh, with Vietnamese content, educational content uh, that is made outside of Vietnam. Um, and my mom, especially, she had uh, um, she had connections with directors and people from Vietnam who she grew up with and you know was in that uh, the theater group with. So because of those connections, we were able to work with kids in Vietnam um, and we were able to work with, you know, find Xuân Mai and uh, I like to look at it as something almost kind of like a Mickey Mouse Club, but like for the Vietnamese community where you have, you know, big pop stars that are current big pop stars now, but they originated from being in a kids group uh, in Vietnam that was also a part of the Hei Jie. So the legacy that my parents have built is just unmatched uh, when it comes to 
of Vietnamese children's programming in the Vietnamese community. Unfortunately, um, after uh, the transition from VHS to uh, DVD, technology made it possible for people to um, make copies of their programs without losing the quality. So before, if it was VHS, if you copied it, the, there would be a generational um, uh, change from each copy. Mm -hmm. But with, you know, um, digital, uh, you can just copy and you can like copy all these DVDs onto one little USB and, and uh, sell it. So uh, after a while, my parents who were investing so much money in production for children's programming, they lost their company um, to bankruptcy. And I remember the day that we went to close down our iconic store in Phuc Lop Tha. So mm -hmm. Phuc Tha is like an Asian garden mall mm -hmm. and it is like the icon of like little Saigon. And we had a very popular store there with like children's videos. And my mom, she created a space that has like games and all these activities for kids. So anytime any kid goes to the Asian Garden Mall, they would want to go to that store. Mm -hmm. So it was a it was a very popular store back then. And for uh, myself personally, I went to that store every single holiday because that was the day that we would, you know, give off our, our employees. Mm -hmm. So I would come there and celebrate all of our holidays there. And it was just such a big part of my growing up. Mm -hmm. And I had grown up feeling like I'm going to one day take over this company and I'm going to, this is going to be um, like my, um, my inheritance mm -hmm. for the family, you know? And so I had... I had a lot of plans mm -hmm. growing up. Even when I was like three, I was like on film sets um, and I got to experience and learn so much. Uh, and then when I went to, when I grew up a little bit, I went to uh, Orange County High School of the Arts, which is a school um, that is academic, but also teaches um, you the art side as well. So I actually specialize in film and television since I was 12. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I did that just all in preparation mm -hmm. of, you know, taking over this company and continuing my parents' work. Um, and then the day that we came to shut down the company, I remember seeing my parents look on their face and it was a lot of disappointment. And if you could just imagine like your whole life's work, the whole world basically knows you for that. And now you have to let it go. That May no I ask what year it was? Then? Oh, man, it was, um, I think it was in 2005. 2005. Um, yeah, around around that time. I was around 15. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember seeing their faces and I just told myself, like, I'm going to one day, I'm going to take over this and I'm going to build it back up and I'm going to, continue their passion in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And so that is really kind of my origin story mm -hmm. of who I am today and what my dreams and passions are. That's a very heartfelt story. It kind of made me a little emotional because um, to start and build something like that and um, having it kind of like taken away, but they still have hope, which is you. Um, and you'll tell a little bit more about that and you are honoring their legacy. So I just um, wanted to ask, like, first of all, I know that your mom started off in a creative background. So that's very rare in the Vietnamese industry and community. And so for her to start in the industry, she chose creativity over certainty. So did she, how does she like, teach you like that and navigate in this kind of world that we live in because um in the aapi community i notice a lot of uh, my friends in the entertainment they're like no my parents said if you're going to choose art have a backup um but we also ho secretly hope that you would give it up yeah so with your mom having that story um uh, with the whole you know having to shut down did she ever tell you maybe you should pick certainty over creativity oh of course yes you did. <laughs> of course you know like because i i feel like i had a very um opposite experience as most asian americans um i kind of grew up with you know the creative parents um and uh a lot of times instead of saying you have to be a doctor or a lawyer they would be like are you sure like 
if you want to be a doctor, you have to like blood. They would like say that and remind me like, oh, you have to really enjoy what you do. And can you really look at blood every day? Like they would ask me that, you know? And so it's like the opposite of like a, of a Asian parent, you know? Um, but, you know, after their um, bankruptcy and their shutdown and, you know, uh, I had a few years of attempting to resuscitate their company on my own. Mm -hmm. um, they had, you know, continuously encouraged me like, hey, you should do something else like business or, you know, focus on uh, something that is not going to disappoint you, mm -hmm. you know, because they've they've been so disappointed that they did they didn't want me to go down the same path. So it surprises people because some people are thinking, oh, she's probably feeling pressure to continue uh, her parents' company because this is what they did and now mm -hmm. she has to do it. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that this is something that I chose for myself and my parents ac have actually like told me not to do it. Mm -hmm. And they're like, just let it go. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's kind of so ingrained in who I am and it's something that I've been a part of since I was a baby. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's just, you know, in my blood, it's in my DNA that I have to continue their work. Yes, and I, I don't, I would, I don't think that your parents even uh, understand how much they have impacted the Vietnamese community. Um, I was born and raised in Arkansas. It's a very small town, and when you want to get uh, any kind of like it's like blockbuster for Vietnamese, play. <laughs> I forgot what it's called, but I my my dad would drive there for thirty minutes to get me a tape mm -hmm. of Tehe Drea. So, and we were, I grew up very poor, so I would get one tape and I would watch it for like three years <laughs> over and over. And I would be like, oh my gosh, these oh yai that these little kids would wear. And I was like, I was begging my mom if I can get them. She's like, we don't have that here in Arkansas. We like live in the middle of nowhere. Um, but it was just so impactful. And my mom would teach me how to sing and, 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 and read and write in Vietnamese. But watching that tape, it's, it helps me a lot. It's like, like you said, it's, it's kind of like, Barney and Sesame Street in the Vietnamese version. I learned to count. I learned to like even kind of copy them the dance move poorly. But I, I think it's just so incredible. So may I ask um, a little bit like where is your mom right now in, in terms of like has she accepted um, that you decided to take on this legacy? Does she feel a little pressure by it? Yeah, um, so my mom currently right now, she is doing something very similar to what she was doing before, but for a different target audience. Mm -hmm. uh, so what my mom and dad does is that they um, teach guitar classes, uh, music classes to seniors. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, uh, it's really a beautiful thing because there's a lot of senior citizens whose kids have you know, moved out, they've, they moved away, they have families, you know, and these senior citizens, they feel so, so sad and so lonely. And it, this group really uh, developed during the pandemic when they couldn't, you know, people couldn't gather. And so they started teaching and forming these groups, um, on, on zoom. And, uh, and they created this community and it's so cute because before my mom would create these you know beautiful numbers she would choreograph these numbers uh, for all these kids when i was young mm -hmm. but then now she's like choreographing all these dance numbers and performances for all these senior citizens and they're just as cute in a different way you know and so um i think she's very happy with uh, where she's at right now and she's very passionate and i think for her it's as long as she is keeping um, music in people's lives, uh, keeping people connected and giving people a sense of community. She's happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and yes, she's accepted uh, what, what I do. I mean, she was never against it, but she was always, you know, letting me know, like, you know, these are the realities of it. And this is not something that you should do to like make money, you mm -hmm. know? So she's a, she's a realist, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have grown up in a family um, that I would have to say is a very uh, secure family. Um, they were, um, both my parents were actually educated in the French uh, system, mm -hmm. um, school system. And so the way that they uh, view parenthood and um, my, our relationship with them is actually a very westernized uh, view of it. It was never 
uh, the typical Asian parent was like, oh, you have to do what I say because I'm the parent. But mm -hmm. we would actually have like family meetings and they would ask us how we feel. Wow. You know, I would I remember I had um, um, my, my best memory of my dad is, you know, whenever we would have family issues or if my mom and I, we had conflict with anything, mm -hmm. my dad would take me on a father daughter date and we would just walk on the pier and he would buy me hot cocoa and then he would hear me out and listen to how I felt about it. And then he would explain to me calmly the other perspective and we would come to an agreement. It was a very mature way and that was just how I was raised. Mm -hmm. And I'm so lucky. I'm so fortunate to have experienced that when I hear a lot of you know, other friends who are so jealous of the relationship that I have with my parents. I'm jealous. <laughs> I listened to this and I'm, I think you are the first person, really? you know, outside the show, friendships, uh, I've had, this was very rare, yeah. very, very rare experience that you have. Uh, usually, you know, funny story just to lighten up the mood a little more. Um, my dad would be like, all right, um, I know you're mad with your mom. Let's pick a side. You like me more. You're right. Like, let's go have a daughter, daddy daughter day. And then okay. we'll be like, all right, see, I'm your favorite. This is why it's very, um, it's a little toxic, but I love my dad, but that's extremely rare. And may I ask, like, uh, is it just something that they, uh, learn over time, be, um, just trials and errors or how, how did they find that like a, a healthy way to you know communicate that with you because i realized like communication is very difficult especially when um you know different generation you know yeah i think that um i mean nobody can say like oh i'm the perfect parent or i can i know what to do especially like in the old the the previous generation um there's there's a lot of different ways of teaching your children uh, back then. But one thing that I have to say that um, is helpful for any generation is the awareness. Um, and I think that's the most important like key part to being a parent is just um, being aware of how your actions are going to affect your children. And so my parents had a big love for learning and being aware and so um i remember my parents would have stacks of parenting books mm -hmm. all the time they would read um a lot mm -hmm. and so funny story i remember when i was around six or seven years old um i found a book that said how to parent your six or seven year old and i was like oh my god this is what mom's been reading to discipline me, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I read it um, and I was I was holding it. And I was like, oh my God, this is this is exactly what she's doing to me. <laughs> and so- <laughs> You found her, yeah. her secret cookbook. Yeah, I found her, yeah. So it was, it, it's just like a funny story that um, we were trying to figure each other out. Mm -hmm. But I think, um, you know, that's, that's the key to, I think being a good parent is just trying your best. And of course, I think many parents like they try their best but I think the best thing is just to be aware mm -hmm. of the psychology behind your actions for your children and you know I my daughter is still very young but all I can say um now I don't know what type of you know mommy issues I'm gonna instill yeah. to her but what I can say is that I'm trying very hard and I'm trying to be very aware mm -hmm. um of uh, what we pass down to them. Yes, and I think you've influenced, uh, been influenced by your parents' teaching in such a positive way. Again, this is so rare. Um, I usually hear a lot of um, difficult stories, and you know, from uh, a lot of people in, within the AAPI communicate communication is very difficult. And um, so I just wanted to, you know, kind of transition into um, kind of like how you manage to do the mommy and me. I know you spoke a little bit about it, but the mommy and me Vietnamese production. So when did that start and how are you doing that with being a mom and, you know, you're a multifaceted person, so you have so much stuff going on. So can you tell me just a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So um, before I talk about Mommy and Me, I want to kind of just lay out the foundation of how I got here. Um, so after my parents had closed their company, I continued uh, with film school. Um, I was... Um, I, to be honest, when I was in high school, I did not 
do very well. Like I wasn't like the straight A student. I wasn't the best at the top of my class. Um, I was very fueled by my film classes and I loved it so much. Um, and then I got to be a part of a uh, program, a summer program from uh, Chapman University. And when I went, I met so many other film students, high school film students that were my age, and they were just all so talented. And I said, I, I thought to myself like, wow, they're so talented and they have good grades. I really need to step up my game. And so the very next year, it like kind of put a spark in me and it made me actually graduate high school early. So not only did I pass all my classes, but I actually finished high school early and I started going to college by 16. Mm -hmm. um, and then fast forward, I graduated um, with a, um, a bachelor degree in uh, film and media studies from UCI when I was 20. So before I can even, before I was even of the drinking age. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, ever since then, I started to try to revamp my family's company. I try to make it a nonprofit because we weren't making profits. So mm -hmm. it should be a nonprofit, right? And so that we can get uh, donations from people and help, you know, have the community fuel the company. But to be honest with you, at that time, it was just me. Mm -hmm. And it became very lonely, especially you're 20 years old, you just graduated from college. Uh, you're just by yourself. Anytime you want to film something, you have to like, find all these equipment and it's just like a lot of work and you know and I would have to manage like getting the sponsors by myself and all that it was so much work um so I started working for tv stations because a lot of these tv stations uh, a lot of the Vietnamese tv stations they needed content for kids and there was really not many other people in the community who wanted to do that mm -hmm. um and I have to say that working with kids is a whole nother animal than working with adults because kids or adults, you can tell them to sit down and wait or act or do something or smile mm -hmm. um, and they will do it because they want to get paid. <laughs> kids don't care about money. They don't care about anything. Yeah. You know, like if they don't want to do it, they don't want to do it. There's nothing that you can tell them mm -hmm. to, you know, mm -hmm. so it. It, I realized that I had that special skill that I had acquired from working with kids so many years, you know, so I started working for uh, TV stations and I wanted to, I just wanted to continue what my parents were doing. Mm -hmm. And so they were able to find sponsors and be able to pay me to create all these things. And, you know, I had kind of like a playground and kind of like a place to hone my skills mm -hmm. um, and connect with uh, so many people and kind of like, you know, grow my network uh, for like 10 years, mm -hmm. you know? And so I knew that I had always wanted to continue my parents' work. And I had, at that time, I figured if I can't do it on my own, at least I'm still doing it. It's just in someone else's name, you know? And then um, when I had my daughter, I, I um, knew that I always knew that I wanted her to be bilingual and speak Vietnamese. And uh, I just I knew that. But she was like, you know, a newborn. So it's a little bit early to teach them Vietnamese, you know. But then one day when she was nine months old, you know, she was watching Miss Rachel on YouTube and Miss Rachel is this very popular toddler. Oh, I teacher. know. I see it all over yeah. social media. Yeah. It's very comforting. Yeah, yeah. And um, she was watching Miss Rachel and she started to respond and say things to Miss Rachel in English. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, oh, wait, why is she speaking English? <laughs> I wanted her to speak Vietnamese first, you know? And I was like, I can't believe how early learning starts. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, we know that they learn like, you know, as as newborns, like you talk to them and stuff. But I just couldn't believe how early like the language development starts. And I, I so many people are just so in love with Miss Rachel. And at first, you know, if you are not a parent and you watch Miss Rachel or Blippi or all these characters, you're like, whoa, why is their voice so high? It's kind of creepy, you know, mm -hmm. or like it's not it's so weird, you know. But then if you are a parent and you have a child and you realize like, oh my gosh, like they really connect with my child. And I started watching her and 
I was so inspired by her, not only by the way that she can connect with children, but by the fact that she can have a green screen behind her and it's not even green screened out, it's still there. Or like some of her videos, like, you know, her earlier videos when she first got started, it was like at home in her, you know, in just in her living room and the lighting was so bad, but kids mm -hmm. love it. It doesn't matter. They don't care about that stuff. Yeah. And that really like motivated me. And I'm like, you know what? I don't need a lot of capital to, to continue this work. And I don't need all this fancy stuff. Mm -hmm. All I need to be is, is me, you know? And all I have to be is talking to my child and talking to a toddler, mm -hmm. you know? And so I started creating uh, Mommy and Me and uh, I have to say that when I released my first episode, it took me so long to release my first episode because I was paralyzed with fear of how people would react to it because I feel like the anticipation was so much. There were so many parents uh, who really wanted to uh, watch it. And so many parents grew up with Tehe Jet Productions. So their expectation of the daughter of Tehe Jet Productions has to, it has to be professional and it has to be good. And at that time I didn't have any budget. So it was just kind of like, I, everything is filmed on my phone. It's still filmed on my phone, mm -hmm. you know? So how, like, it, it was really scary, mm -hmm. you know? But so many people, they said, just rip off the bandaid and just, you know, and just release it and then just keep doing it and working on it and and it will just slowly get better, you know? And so now here we are today on episode 14. And I have to say that my episode, my, my, my skills as a, um, my technical skills have been growing. I've been understanding more about what kids uh, want. Um, the, because of, you know, the reach of, um, uh, more people knowing about it. I've been able um, to get more sponsorships. I've been able to get more support. Um, and then, you know, in the last month, we had our one year anniversary. Congratulations. Yeah. Oh. And, and it was, and, and it, it was, uh, it was so comforting mm -hmm. to see the result of the work that I'm doing. Um, you know, I can say that Mommy and Me Vietnamese is not perfect yet. It's, mm -hmm. of course, it's like nothing compared to like Coco Melon or all these like, you know, professionally done uh, programming with high budgets, even like, you know, the children's programming in Vietnam, they have big budgets, mm -hmm. you know, but for, for me and with my little budget and my little dream, uh, for me to just post, you know, several times on social media, I didn't even do... Um, like the studio tours of like, you know, telling everyone to like, please come out to my event. Mm -hmm. But all I did was I posted it once or twice on social media and we had waitlisted for the event, like continuously. It filled up with like 250 people, like, like in a few minutes, you mm -hmm. know. And, and our team watched it. We, we love it. Yeah. I think it's adorable because, okay, first of all, I mean, for you to do this on an iPhone, I couldn't even tell. Oh, and I, I love it. So <laughs> hopefully with my future kids, if I have future kids, I'll let them watch it. But I, I, I'm, I'm curious. So you just filmed this at home in your in comfort of your home. And I just want to understand, like, can you give me like an episode that's your favorite that you want to share? And what does that entail? Like, what do you, how do you like get this all draft out to film it? Does yeah. it take you like a week, you know? Oh, no, it doesn't take me a week. Oh, okay. <laughs> it takes me a while, especially since uh, I'm a mom. So mm -hmm. I am continuously um, trying to work on it while my uh, daughter is clinging on to me. Mm -hmm. um, but um, my most recent episode, I think, is my favorite. Uh, it's the numbers episode. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad that I waited this long to do the numbers episode because I think if you, um, I think like, Naturally, you would think like first episodes would be ABCs and one, two, threes, you know, yeah. but the approach that I took with mommy and me was that, you know what, babies don't care about what ABCs are. They can't read, mm -hmm. you know, they don't know what numbers are. They don't know what colors are. Like we want to teach them like who mom, who your family members are, mm 
Okay. You know, we want to teach them things that they will use right away, mm -hmm. like, um, you know, things that are around them, mm -hmm. you know, or even we had like our first few episodes was like baby sign language because that's how they can communicate with people. But then now, especially now that my daughter is uh, growing up, so I decided to do numbers because it's finally a concept that she can understand. You know, and I think a lot of the episodes, they are actually based on my daughter and where she is uh, developmentally. So I just hope that as long as I'm catering to her and her specific age, mm -hmm. as she grows up, I will create a library mm -hmm. for children, you know, from one to five. Or, you know, if I have another one, then we'll have like, you know, dual libraries going on. And then, you know, by the time she's a teen, then you'll have all these like, you know, from ages zero to like teenage programming for kids. That's, um, that's absolutely in incredible because you, you may say this is for children, but you'd be surprised. I actually um, know a lot of people, this might be anecdotal, everyone's experience is different, but I have a lot of pageant girls that I help. Um, they always tell me, I wish one thing that I could go back in time. I just wish I speak uh, and learn Vietnamese better. Seriously. I, I was like, where can I show them how to speak Vietnamese? Like, how do I speak Vietnamese fluently? Mm -hmm. You know, like, I feel like I'm forgetting my, my roots, my culture, and I, I don't know what to say to them. I'm like, I, I guess go download Duolingo, um, but I can send them your videos now and be like, they can learn the basics, right? Yeah, um, well, I mean, actually, um, that is a big factor of mommy and me Vietnamese too, because this generation is very different from, the, from our generation. Yeah. Um, and in that, Many of the parents who are watching now also don't speak Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've gotten the feedback like, why would you invest your time in Vietnamese content when the future is that people are going to speak less and less and less Vietnamese? You are, um, you know, catering to a demographic that is shrinking, you know? And so my answer is, well, actually, what I found is that this generation, the, the, the generation where the parents grew up in the US not speaking Vietnamese, I found that they want their kids to speak Vietnamese even more. Mm -hmm. Because I think our parents' generation, when they came over, they were so focused on assimilation and making sure that their kids fit in that they didn't care if their kids spoke Vietnamese, they would want their kids to focus on English. They themselves wanted to learn English so that so they wanted to practice with their kids. And the result of that is that many people don't speak Vietnamese. But then for our generation, when we grew up not speaking Vietnamese, we knew how it felt like to be to feel disconnected, to feel like we couldn't understand, to feel like we didn't truly understand our roots and our heritage. Mm -hmm. and, and so I found that the parents now who experience that, like, like you and like me, we want to gift our children that understanding of where we came from, our family history. And it's so important for this generation to really just accept who you are mm -hmm. and not be ashamed of that. And we find that not only in the Vietnamese community, but we find that in the AAPI community now, mm -hmm. we see that there's you know a lot of toys and dolls and books mm -hmm. that have representation now and it matters. And, and it's it's beautiful and it's all fueled by parents of our generation. Yeah, I think you said it was very well said. I, I, I love that because I, I do like to see different Barbie dolls and different hair colors. And now you're saying like, I like to see that more in like on social media. And I do think that's incredible. And it's really hard um, to understand like, you know, sometimes our parents, they, they would be like, oh, you know, you have to understand Vietnamese, you have to do. It. And I think that adds a little bit of pressure to the young generation. They're like, I can't speak bit well. You know what? You have to want it. And it's so cool to learn an extra language. And you can just do it and look and do your own research. Just do little by little. And it can start with mommy and me Vietnamese production. <laughs> so I just want to understand a little bit. Like, I know you said a little bit about um, your scheduling. So it's not that difficult to set that up. But let me ask, how are you taking good care of yourself while doing this production, while um, taking care of your kid? How, um, some of the mental health techniques that you do, if you want to share with us. Yeah, um, for me, I think um, since we have such a small team and, you know, we have built a team now and 
uh, Mommy and Me Vietnamese wouldn't be possible without my little sister who is just another another Sophie. She's another part of me. She grew up with the same story, with the same family, with the same upbringing. And, you know, now we have the same dreams and passion. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when people say, I wish I had a clone so, you know, I can, someone can help me or whatever. So she is basically um, another me who she just feels the same way. Has she been on the any of the footage of the Tehe Tre? Oh yeah, okay. she was the one who did the commercial. That's like what I would have gua that you Which really like. Daddy, you're so handsome. Yeah, Daddy, you're so handsome. Like buy me a Tehe a video, mm -hmm. and then afterwards, like compliment Dad. Like that's your sister. That's my sister. Oh, she's so cute. Yeah, so mm -hmm. she she was actually I think more popular in Tehe than I was, mm -hmm. uh, because when I was young, um, they my parents didn't want to film me as much because they wanted to kind of protect my identity mm -hmm. uh, but then when my sis by the time my sister was born they're like oh it's gonna be fine so <laughs> so she <laughs> that's how it is with parents uh -huh. but um so she was in it a lot more than me even mm -hmm. uh so and now she does the musical component for uh, mommy and me Vietnamese oh. um so we are so blessed to have her talent because she is actually a music composer. Mm -hmm. uh, so she composes a lot of the original songs in mm -hmm. Mommy and Me. Uh, so she's a big part. And then we have uh, a volunteer who is a professional, uh, rec like he has a professional recording studio and he's a professional cameraman. Mm -hmm. uh, so he does all of our technical stuff now. Oh, and so our, our, our new content is... Uh, much more professional, um, both audio and video wise. But um, back to your question about uh, schedule management, um, I I just try to remember, um, and I tell myself all the time that I'm doing this for my daughter. That's that is the foundation for everything. Mm -hmm. And if in 15 years, if my daughter looks back. And every time she thinks about mommy and me Vietnamese is mm -hmm. she thinks about the back of her mom's head and me saying, I'm too busy right now. I need to work on this. Then I have, I would have failed mm -hmm. because in the end it's for her. Right. And so I have this rule for myself where every time she asks me, mommy, can you play with me? I will step away and I will put my phone down and I will step away from my work and I will play with her because how many years do you get that them wanting to play with you before they're like, mom, go away, I'm, you know, leave me alone. You know, so how many years do you get that? You know, and the result of that is that my production is very slow right mm -hmm. now. Um, I've had, you know, TV stations reach out to me saying, we wanna, we wanna go all in, in this. We want an episode a week. You know, and I'm just like, right now, my priority is my family. And I think that um, that mentality and unfortunately, that is a choice that a lot of mothers have to make. But it's in the end of the day, still a choice that I'm very proud of. Um, and I think that even though mommy and me Vietnamese is not growing as fast as I want to, I believe that I've created a foundation that will allow me to continue this after you know, she starts going to school and she has, she gets more busy with, you know, her friends and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so I think for me, my foundation is balance mm -hmm. um, and just remembering the core reason of why you even started what you did. Yeah, that's very well said. And I, I, I want to go back to what you said before. You said when you first uh, started at the first episode of Mommy and Me, you were very anxious about what other people think. And I can imagine because your project represents you. And I understand like the pressure you may, I can't fully understand, but I can understand a, a little bit of bit about the, the, the social pressure part. So how do you, um, any advice you want to give to anyone who wants to start something like that and have their parents um, kind of wait on their shoulder a little bit if, if their parents have a legacy like that? Do you have any advice for them? I would just have to say, just do it. And I think this is, um, you know, advice that I have to continuously remind myself to. But I think any parent or any person who does any project has to remember that you have to remember that you're human. Mm -hmm. I think we have we we try to be so perfect all the time and we're afraid of what people think about us. But I think that there's a beauty of 
um, showing people that you're not perfect and you make mistakes. And um, it's kind of like an underdog story where people can see you grow and people will root for you if you started off with, you know, um, not as good and then they see you grow over the years and they feel like they've grown with you. And I mean that with professionally, but I also mean that as a parent as well, because I think a lot of um, the mentality of like parents is like, we want to show our children that we're perfect and we never make mistakes, you know? But in the end of the day, when you understand how to apologize to your child, they will see that you're human and they will respect you more for that. And they will not be so shocked when they turn into a teenager and they're like, oh my God, my mom is a human, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, just like a funny story off of, me apologizing to my daughter is that, you know, she was going through an age where she was hitting a lot. And I would tell her like, no hitting, you know, but one day she walked by me and she was so cute. And I just had to hit her in the butt, you know, because she's just so cute. So I hit her and she turned around and she said, no hitting mommy. And I'm like, that is true. I should have hit you, but you're just so cute. And she's like, she's like, go time out mommy. And I was just like, I deserve that. Oh. And so I, I went to timeout and I stood there and actually at home, we don't call it timeout. We call it uh, reflection time, which is it's the same concept as timeout. But I want her to go to the corner so that she can kind of think about what she did. Mm -hmm. um, so I went to the corner and I demonstrated to her what it means to go through your consequences and take responsibility for it and then come back and apologize for it. So I demonstrated that with her. Um, so that's just a little example of showing other people that you are human, like you do make mistakes, but in the end of the day, it's okay because we are going, we're, we're going to get through this together as long as we learn from it. I, I think, I think it's just so incredible that you prioritize being a mother first and it's, that's just so beautiful and I want to tell you, please tell your daughter when you get home, thank you for letting me borrow her, her mom <laughs> for a few seconds she is your manager first so thank you for that and i i just love to hear the stories about you and how you're able to balance that because i i can't imagine the pressure um just being a mom i'm not a mom but you know i used to have a goldfish and it died so <laughs> I, I realized i need to do better in life <laughs> as long as you learned right <laughs> I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the Vietnamese culture and, and how we can be able to promote that more in, in the um, Amer Vietnamese American generation. If you can share a little bit that into the camera. Dạ yeah, vâng. À, vâng thưa quý vị, à, Sophie Bảo Trân hy vọng là quý vị có thể cho con em xem chương trình Mommy and Me Vietnamese. Đây là một chương trình mà Bảo Trân đã tự làm à, để tặng con gái của Bảo Trân à, cũng như là à, các trẻ em vòng quanh thế giới mà muốn à, học về à, văn hóa Việt Nam và bảo tồn à, ngôn ngữ tại vì người Việt còn, nước Việt còn và tiếng Việt còn thưa quý vị à, Bảo Trân cũng biết rằng là cũng có rất là nhiều À, phụ huynh trẻ bây giờ có con trẻ thì những phụ huynh đó thì cũng không có biết uh, nói tiếng Việt à, hay là có thể là lấy chồng hay là vợ không phải là người Việt Nam à, nên là Bảo Trân đã tạo ra cái chương trình này để mà nguyên cả gia đình có thể ngồi chung với nhau để mà mình mình nhớ rằng á, là tiếng Việt học tiếng Việt là không phải là chỉ là việc của em bé thôi nhưng mà học tiếng Việt là có thể là một cuộc hành trình cho nguyên cả gia đình và một cái lý do để gia đình có thể um, vui chung với nhau I wanted um, I wanted mommy and me Vietnamese and I wanted the Vietnamese language to not only just be something that the, the not only for the child to learn but i want it to be used as a bonding experience because when the family is learning together that is actually your chance to bond with your child yeah thank you you said that so elegantly and so beautiful your vietnamese is like 10 out of 10. Oh, i approve <laughs> um and where can we find you on social media and can you tell us a little bit about your upcoming projects like what's what's going to be next for sophie 
Yeah, so um, you can find us on YouTube. You just look on uh, Mommy and Me Vietnamese. Um, or if you um, prefer, you can uh, type in Thế Hệ TV. Uh, that is um, the, our old channel's name, but now I took over. Um, and uh, you can also find us on Instagram. I'm uh, pretty active on Instagram, and I'm trying to, to grow it Um because I believe that that's where our parents are now. Um, and so you can find us on Instagram. And uh, for me right now, I'm super excited about our, our YouTube channel. Um, we are around at 80, 80,000 subscribers right now. Congratulations, yes. that's awesome. Only in one year, we have grown so much. And so my goal for the end of the year is to get that silver YouTube button. Uh, so if you can help us out and if you feel like Mommy and Me Vietnamese is something that uh, can help your family, uh, please subscribe to us mm -hmm. so that we can uh, reach that goal and that would be really helpful so that we can continue our work. Uh, Asian Media Network would definitely set you up with that. Uh, they're really good with that. They have um, a lot of subscribers and thank you so much again, Chị Sophie. Cảm ơn chị đã tin tưởng vào em, organization của em. We're so hân hạnh to have you here. Um, and thank you so much. And we wish you nothing but success. And um, we cannot wait to witness more on social media. And I cannot wait to share the videos to those who wants to learn Vietnamese. And I think uh, what you're doing, it's very positive within the AAPI community. So thank you again for having um, us here to help with, to work with you. So mm, I'm so honored to even meet you. So thank you. Thank you.